Hello and welcome to this Chemistry World webinar. I'm Ben Valsler, Chemistry World's Digital Editor. I'm here to welcome you to a webinar that we've created in partnership with Schrodinger. As I'm sure you know, Schrodinger is a leading provider of advanced molecular simulations and enterprise software solutions and services for its clients in the materials science research space. And that's precisely what we're looking at today, because today we'll be looking at a chemist's view on R&D digitalization in materials innovation. Now, there are global challenges ahead of us, like a clean energy future, a circular economy, and so on, and they've increased the demand for new materials. And typically, the performance of materials depends on a multitude of parameters, which makes traditional research approaches, which rely on experiments solely, they are slow, they're inefficient, and they're prohibitively expensive. Data-driven approaches can significantly speed up the discovery process and shorten the time from idea to market. And so over the course of the next hour, we're going to learn about the integration of Schrodinger's machine learning technologies with physics-based modeling that can be utilized to predict properties of new materials without necessarily having to make them in a lab. We will hear about use cases from material science areas and how data generated can be used to build machine learning models. And we'll see how the integration of machine learning approaches into collaborative design schemes can maximize their usability and accessibility. Now, today we're using GoToWebinar as our means to interact with you. Uh, so already you should be able to see my face and you should be able to see the slide that we're sharing. Throughout the course of today's webinar, there will be a presentation that you can see. There will be webcams for some of it. If you're on a slow connection, you can just hit the button above the webcam to hide them all. And that should mean that you preserve the best quality audio and you see everything that's on the slides without seeing the webcam. So we recommend you do that. And for those of you who are here for the live presentation, there will be a Q&A section after the presentation as well. So get your questions into the questions box, which should be at the bottom of the GoToWebinar panel. There will also be a recording made available to everybody who can't make it today, and we'll send it back to you in your email over the course of the next few days. And for those of you who did attend, you will also get a certificate of attendance. That's our way of saying thanks. So if you are watching the recording now and you would have liked to ask some questions, then don't worry, there will be plenty of other opportunities because this is part of a series of webinars that we are doing with Schrodinger. There'll be a new webinar every month throughout 2021. So you still have plenty of time to engage with this topic, find out how Schrodinger's software solutions and integrations can really help you in your work and get your questions in when you attend live. Now, joining me on screen now is Laura Scarbath Evers. Now, Laura uh, studied chemistry at Eberhard Karls University of Tübingen and at the University of Leipzig, and then got a PhD in computational chemistry from the Martin Luther University of Halle Wittensburg. Uh, she is a senior scientist at Schrodinger. She supports customers in Europe from different material science areas in successfully applying molecular modeling to advance their research. Laura, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, you have been very kind to prepare this presentation for us covering these quite diverse areas there's a lot to pack into the hour so i should uh, i should stop and hand it over to you now and then we'll come back for some q a for the live attendees uh, after your presentation so thanks again for joining us laura well thank you ben for this really nice introduction um i'm very pleased to be here today and i'm looking forward to discussion welcome everyone to my welcome to my webinar a chemist view on r d digitalization and materials innovation um, as we've just heard, my name is Laura Scarbert Evers. I'm a senior scientist at Schrödinger, and today we are going to discuss how the integration of machine learning with physics based modeling and enterprise informatics transforms material discovery. Before we start, I'd like to say a few words about Schrödinger and our mission. So, the mission of Schrödinger is to provide um, integrated software solutions with the goal to improve human health and quality of life by transforming the way ther therapeutics and materials are discovered. We approach this goal by providing a tripodal molecular design platform. And this molecular design platform combines physics based modeling, machine learning, and enterprise informatics. The physics based modeling part includes physics based computational approaches to predict molecules' key properties and with an accuracy which is comparable to physical experiments. So this enables us, on the one hand, to use um, atomistic uh, modeling to precisely design the molecules that we need. On the other hand, um, when we generate a lot of data using physics-based modeling, we can utilize these data for machine learning approaches. And seeds us directly to the next part, the machine learning deep learning part. 
And here Schrodinger provides solutions to train machine learning models to non-experts and non-experts alike. And with these trained models, we can then evaluate billions of molecules quickly and discover high quality novel molecules. Last but not least, we also have a part um, um, which covers the enterprise informatics, and this includes an ideation platform for collaboration across multiple locations. And this collaborative platform enables live sharing of computational and experimental data and design ideas for rapid decision making. And also very important, it provides easy access to expert computational technology and models. Let's take a closer look at our three business verticals. First of all, we have the small molecule drug discovery suite, and this is focused on accelerating lead discovery and lead optimization, typically used in pharma industry to discover new compounds. We also offer a biologic suite. Um, this one provides solutions for modeling and proteins, for modeling proteins and antibodies. And last but not least, we have the material science suite, which I'm going to talk about today. And this one um, offers integrated solutions for simulations of a variety of chemical systems from material science. Okay, and one important characteristic of material science is that it's such a diverse field. So it ranges from small um, optical electronic molecules over periodic solids, crystals to polymers, and even up to complex structure solutions formulations. So this means in material science, we cover a lot of different system sizes and time scales. And the Schrodinger Materials Science Suite offers solutions for all of this, these areas. And regardless of the different areas we are talking about, they all face the same challenges. Due to global threats like climate change and a limited availability of resources like oil and gas, and also increasing volumes of waste, we need to find either completely new technological solutions or replace traditional materials with biodegradable ones. This means that we need new materials fast. Let's take a look how new materials um, have been traditionally developed. First of all, the scientists, they have to come up with an idea. This means that they're typically limited already by human bias. So perhaps they think only of structures they already know. In the second step, they would then have to synthesize the molecule. This takes time, it's resource intense, and again, produces waste. And with this, we are already limited with regards to the number of molecules we can realize. In the third step, the scientists then have to analyze and test the synthesized structures, which also takes time. And in all this effort, just to find out that um, their candidate they were thinking about probably won't work. This means they have to redo this whole tedious procedure. And so this um, traditional and solely experimental approach is frustrating, time consuming and costly. So the question is, how can we, what can we do to improve? We are currently living in the area of digitalization. So already in 2017, The Economist stated, the world's most valuable resource is no longer oil, but data. And in the same year, it was also estimated that we can unlock a, a, a value of $550 billion through the digitalization of the chemical industry by 2025. Maybe digital approaches can drive the search for new materials. Now I want to take with you a closer look how such a digital R&D platform could look like and how it can accelerate development of new materials. So in the first step, what we would do first is we would create um, automatically a structure library based on a core chemistry using certain permutational algorithms. Then we would already end up with millions of compounds. We can then take this structure library and perform a virtual screening using physics-based approaches and score the results with regard to the desired property, which brings us here to step two. And in an ideal case, we have already got two candidates, so they can go straight to synthesis and performance testing. But what we can do additionally, we can now take all the data generated and use them to train machine learning models. And with these models, we can then make predictions on new structure libraries, which are much larger than the first one. Then we can again score the top molecules and validate the results and send the best um, candidates to synthesis. Additionally, we can um, use the data that, um, that we have created now again using physics-based simulation and use them to refine the machine learning model and um, to iteratively improve it and to make even better predictions on new structural libraries. This sounds all very convincing, um, but we are still 
um, facing some hurdles and challenges. There are several obstacles that we are still facing, which prevent successful digital approaches in chemistry R&D departments. And if we think about important building blocks of such a digital platform, which we've just, just seen, um, we see that we need, first of all, a suitable IT infrastructure to carry out all these simulations. We also need a high degree of automation to enable large virtual screening approaches. And we need an efficient data management to make use of the data that we generated. And today, um, research departments are globally distributed. And the key aspect of the successful digitalization would be to ensure that every department involved in a project gets all the relevant information. But one big challenge that we are facing here are data silos. And according to a report on digitalizations in chemicals, researchers and lab technicians still spend large amounts of time navigating through various internal and external sources. And while some results are shared between these various sources, um, most of the information is not transferred. And this means that the chemist spends a huge amount of time retrieving and aggregating the information which they need to make the best decisions. This also means that um, employees, they tend to rely only on experience accumulated within their own micro environment, which is also a problem. So how can we avoid such data silos? We need a collaborative environment in which data are gathered in one place and are accessible to all the relevant people who work on that project. And our proposed solution for this is a web-based interface, which enables all team members to access the available data, can be experimental, can be computational data, in real time and make appropriate decisions. And by integrating simulation methods or cheminformatics approaches, we can also complement experiments by making predictions about hypothetical molecules and help to only synthesize promising ideas. And I'll get back to that in more detail later. In the following, I would like to go through this digital platform approach step by step and talk about use cases from different material science areas to give you a better idea how the real life application of such a platform might look like. And we would, here we start with the high throughput simulations because those are the first step. And a good example for such a massive theoretical high throughput screening approach is the study on whole transport materials in collaboration with Panasonic. An important property of good um, organic semiconductors is high charge carry mobility. The charge ca um, carry mobility is influenced, um, among other properties, by the reorganization energy. The reorganization energy tells us basically how much a molecule is energetically stabilized due to the change in molecular geometry which occurs during charge transfer. And the good thing is it can be efficiently calculated using quantum mechanical methods such as density functional theory. So in this study, um, in the first step, millions of organic pi conjugated molecules based on different heat cycles were generated using um, such permutation algorithms. And then 250,000 molecules were selected and pre-filtered um, with density functional theory calculations. And since the requirement um, for good charge mobility is that the reorganization energy is as low as possible, the 130 molecules with the lowest predicted reorganization energy were selected as promising candidates for organic semiconductors, and they were transferred to the next step in, this, in the screening approach. And in the next step, um, the influence of the chemical environment was, was considered by performing atomistic classical MD simulations in the condensed phase and subsequently calculating the charge mobility. And again, only the most promising candidates were then um, selected and only they go then to synthesis. So this helps us um, to avoid synthesizing um, candidates which are basically which are um, unsuccessful. If we now take a look at the statistics, um, what we see that in this in total in this project, in, in the project included 3.5 million DFT calculations. Um, this would have required um, 52 compute years of work if we had done it in serial. But due to massively parallelized calculations, it took only approximately 16 days until the results were there. And apart from guiding synthesis, these data, which, were, which have been generated, they can also be used to train machine learning models in order to pre predict the performance of new compounds much faster. 
such virtuous clinic approaches, they are not only um, restricted to small molecules, but they are also suitable to predict the properties of many polymers. And one important property of a polymer is the glass transition temperature, which defines the transition from the glassy to the rubbery state. And in the study that I'm showing here, the glass transition temperature was predicted on more than 300 linear homopolymers using classical molecular dynamic simulations. Therefore, model systems of the entangled polymers were simulated at high temperatures and they were cooled down to low temperatures in order to, to estimate the glass transition temperature. And by utilizing highly automated workflows and um, extensive computational resources, um, many polymers could be simulated at the same time, and so it took um, around 12 days to get all the results. And again, um, done in serial, this would have um, taken 10 years. And with such virtuous screening approaches, we can predict the glass transition temperature of many different polymeric systems in a short time. And this helps us, first of all, to understand how the structure affects the properties of these polymers, but also to discard unsuitable candidates without having to synthesize them. Third example here is a much smaller virtual screening study, and it's done on precursors in atomic layer deposition. And in an atomic layer deposition, the precursor chemistry is the key to successful deposition. And typically, we have several competing requirements that must be met, like, for instance, the reactivity, thermal stability, and volatility. And to achieve this, one usually combines different ligands in one precursor. And the large number of possible combinations then leads to a huge structural library of potential precursor molecules, and they cannot all be tested experimentally. And this is also a very good example where theoretical approaches can help. So in this particular example, 84 zirconium complexes were generated automatically by, by, again, by automated permutation algorithms, and the bond dissociation energy was computed using density functional theory calculations. And the results are shown here in the right-hand graph. And what we can see, so the x-axis shows the different complexes ordered with regard to the bond dissociation energy, and the y-axis shows the um, minimum bond, bond, bond dissociation energy for the complex. And the filled circles um, denote the metal ligand bond dissociation energy for the different ligands. And if we look at all the different um, complexes, what we can see here is that the same metal ligand bond strength varies strongly for the different complexes. So this means that the neighboring ligand has a tremendous and surprising effect on the metal ligand bond strength. And the good thing is we see that we get this um, valuable information already with a very a rather small virtual screening study. Okay, so let's assume that we have done some physics-based virtual screening and we have obtained a large data set of labeled data. And in the next step, we could now use the data to build machine learning models to make predictions on new compounds. And in chemistry, we typically want to link these properties of a material to its underlying structure. This is what makes QSPR models and quantitative, um, quantitative structure property relationship models um, very useful. And additionally, the data can then be used. Again. Yeah. Um, and as we've discussed at the beginning, so material science is a very diverse field and it covers amorphous inorganic solids, periodic solids, small organic molecules, polymers and up to structured solutions. And what we need to do first in order to build bush with machinery models is we must find a way to represent all these structures. And there are different possibilities depending on the material you want to study. And in general, to relate the structure to a property, we must somehow define the structure in a way that the computer understands it. This is done using descriptors and fingerprints. And in the Schrodinger material science suite, we offer a variety of different fingerprints and descriptors to cover the whole range of materials. So for single molecules, as we can see on the left side, we um, offer, among others, linear, dendritic, and radial fingerprints. But we also offer customized polymer descriptors, because unlike sim single, molecule, single molecules, which have um, polymers have a very number of repeat units, and it's therefore important to find descriptors that reflect that. So first of all, um, the, the fingerprints should be normalized with regard to the chain length. And um, what we can also see here in the validation example plot, um, 
now on the on the bottom of the page, we, um, the predicted TGs plotted for the monomer versus the dimer representation in order to make sure that both give the same results. So if we if we basically if we defined the polymer in the dimer representation and in the mono representation, we should end up with the same results because still it is the same homopolymer. Moreover, um, there are other factors which um, strongly influence the morphology and therefore the properties of the polymer, for instance, the stiffness. So the customer, uh, customized polymer descriptors, they take also into account the number of rotatable rotatable bonds, for instance, and also a number of fused ring atoms, which has a strong effect. So if we had a lot of fused ring atoms, for instance, we would increase the stiffness of the polymer, and this would also then strongly affect the properties. We also offer descriptors for organic and inorganic solids. So for instance, MET minor descriptors, um, they are based on formula composition, oxidation state, and structure. Other important descriptors are the SOAP descriptors, um, which stands for smooth overlap of atomic positions, and they describe the 3D atomic sites, and they will also be available soon um, per default in the Schrodinger suite. After finding suitable descriptors, um, researchers are then faced with the next challenge. There are a plethora of machine learning approaches out there, and the question is, does a material scientist have to know them all? And typically, we material scientists, we are not statisticians or mathematicians, so we have maybe a background in chemistry, like I do, or in physics, and we are experts in our specific field of research. And we want to apply machine learning approaches um, to accelerate the research, but we don't typically don't have years to study all the statistical approaches behind it. And even if we were experts in statistics, we would still have to in order to build successful models, we would still have to generate informative descriptors and fingerprints for, for the set of molecules we would like to, to study. And in the next step, we would have to build um, suitable machine learning models on different training and test set splits. We would have to um, evaluate the models, how, the, how they perform. We would have to rank and score them. And we would have to um, run predictions, we would have to visualize and analyze the outcome. So this is a lot of work. And this, a lot of this work can be automated. This is what we have done um, with AutoCuser in the Schrodinger suite. So we have basically all, all these steps which um, occur repeatedly um, are automated. So the only thing the researcher has to provide is, um, is a structural set out of which then the test and training set splits are generated. And everything else, um, the feature selection to the model building and testing is done automatically. We can look also now at the automated steps individually. So the first um, step in this procedure would be the generation of descriptors and fingerprints. And AutoCuser has many built-in descriptors like dendritic, linear, or radial fingerprints, but also the flexibility to select custom descriptors. And the next step would be the feature selection step, where um, the descriptors and fingerprints that do not provide a statistically significant amount of information are discarding. And the remaining ones are then filtered again to remove redundancy. This means after the second step, we end up with informative fingerprints and descriptors. In the next step, the machine learning models are built automatically using different approaches. And this depends whether we have a classification or a regression problem. For classification, we have a categorical variable. And here, for instance, AutoCuser utilizes recursive partitioning or knife bias approaches. And for regression, where we have a continuous dependent variable, um, AutoCuser can utilize, among others, multiple linear regression or kernel-based partially square. And AutoCuser generates automatically a variety of different training and test set splits and builds models using all the different approaches. And then in the final, in the last steps, um, the models are then scored and ranked with regard to performance and reported. And the researcher cannot only see the performance of the different models in the report, but they can also plot automatically um, observed versus predicted values. And they can even visualize the contributions of the different function groups or, or substructures of the molecule. And one big advantage of AutoCuser is that it's already working very well for rather small data sets. But in case we have a large data set, 
Um, the Schrodinger suite also offers automated deep, lear deep learning approaches, namely AutoQSA DeepCam. This approach uses the DeepCam open source package and it's based on graph-based convolutional neural networks. And what we see here on the right-hand side, we see the bar, um, um, we see a plot um, which depicts the R-square values for the atomization energies for over 7,000 stable organic molecules. And we can see here a comparison between AutoQSAR and AutoQSAR DeepCam for a smaller data set and a full data set. And we see that um, the R-square -square -ve value is rather low for traditional AutoQSAR, it's in gray. But we can see that it increases already significantly for AutoQSAR DeepCam if we take a set of 5,000 molecules, and even more if we go to the full data set, which is shown in dark blue. There's also, an, also there's another example for the prediction of the solubility of molecules. And once one with AutoQSA and one with AutoQSA DeepCam. And in both graphs, the x-axis corresponds to the experimental log solubility and it spans over a very wide range. And we see already with AutoQSA, we get quite reasonable results. So we get an R-square value of 0 0.76. But we increase significantly if we use AutoQSA DeepCam um, where we um, get an R-square value of 0 0.88. So we see that it out outperforms um, AutoQSAR on such large data sets. In the following, I would like to discuss some application examples from all the different material science areas um, in order to show where machine learning approaches might be particularly useful. And let's start with an example of the property prediction for glasses. So an example, show, an example shown on the left side, um, the dielectric constant of silicate glasses with added oxides was predicted as a function of temperature, frequency, and, and sodium oxide concentration. And if we take um, a look at the linear plot, um, it shows the dielectric constant versus the predicted one. And we see that we have a quite good agreement for both training and test set. So both have a square value of greater 0.9. We can also look at the um, dielectric constant as a function of the frequency. And this is shown here in the middle plot for two different temperatures. And so the filled, the filled uh, circles that we see here are the experimental measurements at the two different temperatures, and the lines are the, um, the predictions. And we see that we are in good agreement with experiment. We could, also, um, we could also use machine learning to look into the Young's modulus of silicate glass. Um, with varying concentrations of calcium oxide and aluminum oxide. And here the data were taken from, um, from um, computational molecular dynamics. And we see here that we also get a quite good agreement for both training and test sets. And a different area, which I'm showing here, is the prediction of NMR shifts of inorganic solids. And NMR is a very important method and a helpful tool to, for a structural characterization. And machine learning of NMR shifts is rather a new direction. So this, the objective of this study was a benchmark um, for the um, capabilities for the prediction of NMR shifts for inorganic crystals. And we started, um, what we can see here, um, 27 structures were used. And in total, um, they had, in total, um, they had um, 67 unique sites. And of silicon, so unique chemical environments of silicon. So in total, um, there are 67 data points. In this example, a random forest algorithm was used. And we see that also for these um, not so many data points, actually, um, the results, they are very good. So both training and tested have now square value of above 0.9. One important challenge in material science is the search for materials which are suitable for efficient hydrogen storage um, due to the potential of hydrogen as a clean fuel alternative. An important characteristic for these materials are the release temperature, which is the temperature at which the desorption process begins, and the weight percentage of hydrogen that can be stored. And of course, it would be now very tedious to either characterize experimentally all the new po potential materials it will also be computationally demanding to compute um, to compute always these properties. So um, what one can do is um, here machine learning approaches can be very useful in predicting the performance of these potential materials for hydrogen storage. Um, in case um, there are data available which can be used to, to train the models. 
in this example, um, there were data, so the 399 structures from the Hütberg data set were extracted. And, um, and models were built for the release temperature and the weight percentage of, of hydrogen. And we see here that for both materials, we get also again a good agreement between observed and the predicted property. Um, so um, for both, um, the R square value is rather high in both cases for the training set and the test set. So these um, these two properties can could be predicted um, predicted very well using machine learning. The next example um, is about the prediction of the evaporation temperature of organic molecules. And this again demonstrates nicely in which areas machine learning can be particularly useful. Um, because the evaporation temperature is a property which cannot be easily predicted using other physics-based simulations, for instance, one, one would require, require um, extended Gibbs Monte Carlo simulations. And to avoid doing these ex um, um, expensive simulations all the time whenever we have a new compound, it's highly useful to have a built machine learning model to simply predict the evaporation temperature. In this case, this was um, this model was um, built using 1,147 molecules um, and auto QSAR. We can see the results for the evaporation temperature on the right-hand side, and they are quite good. So we have an R-square value of over 0.9 for training and test set. And in a similar fashion, the um, evaporation energy for inorganic compounds can be predicted using machine learning. In this example, um, there were less, there were only 287 structures which were utilized, um, together with the metal minor inorganic descriptors. And we see again here we have a quite good prediction. So we have our square values of over 0.9 if we com look, if you compare, if you look at the linear relationship between the observed evaporation temperature and the predicted one. We can also use machine learning to predict properties of polymers, in that case, um, the dielectric behavior of polymers. And this is also an important example because polymer dielectrics, they are promising candidates for um, e and &E applications, so it stands for electrical and electronic applications. And depending on the area of application, there are specific requirements regarding the dielectric constant and the dielectric loss of the material in order to achieve optimal performance. And in case we have already some data available, um, machine learning approaches could also be very useful here for the prediction of future materials. And on the left-hand side, we see the results for the prediction of the dielectric constant using a random forest model. And we see again here we have um, we have a very good agreement between the observed and the predicted dielectric constant. We can also um, we can also look into the um, we can also predict the dissipation factor, tan delta, which we can see here in the middle. Here, Gaussian process regression model was used. We see again here that we have um, very good agree agreement for both training a test set for um, between the observed and the predicted values. We can also look into the frequency dependent prediction of the dissipation factor. Um, which is which is shown here on the right hand side. Um, so we see the results for the random forest um, for the random forest uh, algorithm in orange and for the um, Gaussian process regression in blue compared to ex experiment. The experiment is denoted by the blue filled cycles here. And we see that we actually observe a quite good agreement between um, experimental and predicted values. And this example shows how the refractive index for small molecules can be predicted for large and small data sets. And if we wanted to compute the refractive index for small molecules using physics-based simulations, we would first need to perform um, quantum chemical calculations, for instance, density functional theory, to obtain the polar polarizability, and then atomistic simulations of the condensed phase to get the system's density. And in order to avoid these um, doing these atomistic simulations repeatedly all over again, whenever we have a new compound we would like to investigate, it would be good to, um, to use machine learning for the prediction of the refractive index. And this is done here for a small and for a larger data set. And in both cases, apart from the structure, also the wavelength, um, namely the range from approximately 350 to 800 nanometer, 
and the temperature were provided as descriptors. And um, we see here for the small data plot, um, for the small data set, um, the linear plot on the left hand side. Um, we see we have also very good agreement for both um, training and test sets. So we have high R square values and low, low root mean square errors. And we also see if we go to larger data sets um, that AutoQSID can perform very well. So just shown here on the right hand side for 10,000 data points. We also we get an R square value of 0.96, but we see also a very good um, agreement between the observed refractive index and the predicted refractive index. And this is an example from a completely different area. So it's rather related to formulations. And it illustrates nicely that AutoQSA can also be applied to data sets of limited size, which is often the case in real life, particularly if it's experimental data. In this case, the critical micelle concentration of surfactants was predicted. Um, surfactants they play an important role in various industrial areas, for instance, personal care, so it can be found in shampoos, soaps, cosmetics, but also in other areas, like for instance, it can be found in paints, steel for inks. And the critical micelle concentration is an important characteristic um, of a surfactant because it tells us at which con um, the concentration above which micelles are formed. And in this case, only 83 data points for non-ionic surfactants were used, and together with six independent descriptors and um, multi multiple linear regression was applied. And we can see here the results on the on the right hand side. And then we see that we have already with such a moderate data um, set, uh, moderate data size data set, we can get quite reasonable results. And so we can successfully apply QSPR approaches only if we have, even though we have only a limited amount of data available. And this example here is about the property protection of polymer modified bitumens. And bitumen is an important material in for pay, um, construction, in particular for paving. Uh, one problem here is that at low temperature, thermal um, tension may cause cracking. And polymer modified bitumens, they show an improved mechanical property and reduce cracking at low temperatures. And here, a machinery can also help to predict the properties um, because um, here they're not easily accessible with computational approaches. Because here we have very complex systems with a lot of different variables. So we have um, we have the, the amount of copolymers, the composition of the of the copolymer. So it would be very hard, if not impossible, to um, simulate such systems with physics-based simulations. And we might not even have all the chemical details, which, which also makes this impossible. Um, in this case, um, for the machine learning, um, a total of 69 base and polymer modified bitumens um, with experimental, measure experimental measurements were provided were taken. And different descriptors like um, base bitumen properties, the percentage of copolymers, the composition of the polymer, and at and three different temperatures. And we see here on the right hand side, we see the um, the linear plot, which shows um, which shows us the results for the creep stiffness. And the creep stiffness is an important parameter because it's a measure of the thermal stress. If the creeps if is out if it's so high, um, cracking will occur. So it's very good to, to know this parameter. And we see here that we also have a very good agreement between um, predicted creep, um, creep stiffness and experimental creep stiffness. In a similar fashion, we can also look at the M value. Um, the M value is um, basically a measure of the rate at which the stress is relieved. So if we have a low M value, this means a lower rel relaxation. So it's also important to know this parameter in order to assess the, um, the performance of the polymer modified bitumens. And we see also here for the M value, we get for the prediction of the M value using machine learning, we get a quite good agreement between um, given or um, experimental and predicted M value. So we have R square values of over 0.9 for both um, training and test sets. So far, um, these, um, these examples um, have basically shown how to um, predict um, structure property relationships. But what if we don't only want to predict properties of molecules, but, but if we want um, the computer basically to create new molecules with optimal properties? 
And this can be done using reinforcement learning. And the procedure is shown schematically, very basically on the left-hand side. In practice, what we would do first is we would first need to generate a large collection of smiles. So this could be either a general smiles library or a collection of smiles which are focused on a certain core chemistry. And then um, the so-called prior network, which is a recurrent neural network, takes the smiles collection as an input to learn the smiles syn syntax and how such a valid smiles expression look looks like. So basically we teach the computer chemistry or how valid chemistry looks like. But so far we haven't learned any properties yet. And this part is done by this core network. And here we provide a large training set of label data to build a model that predicts our target property. And then we have the agent, which is also recurrent neural network. It's derived from the prior, so they basically have the same architecture. And the aim is to train the agent in a way that it only generates structures, which are then scored high by the scorer. And the end goal is then to get only molecules suggested by the agent network that perform well with regard to the desired property. Let's take a look at um, a practical example on the right hand side. And here the uh, target property was a triplet energy higher than 2.9 electron volt. And the training was done in pure organic space, so for TADF molecules. And the procedure was replicated five times. And um, so each each bar in the bar plot represents one run. And um, the top 150 molecules from each run were saved. And if you take a look um, at the structure, so those are the number of um, unique novel compounds with have a um, basically a triplet energy um, larger than 2.9 electron volt. And um, what we see here is that, um, first of all, that um, Basically, the most and majority of the generated compounds in every run have a high triplet energy. So it's almost 150. And if we take a look at the final structures on the bottom here um, that have um, some of the example machine generated compounds, what we can see here, and um, they look indeed like reasonable structures. So they look chemically sound. And the validation of the outcome by density functional theory confirmed that they indeed have the respective triplet energy. And to summarize quickly, so far we have seen that physics-based training methods as well as machine learning approaches can be applied successfully in a variety of different material science areas to accelerate the search for suitable materials significantly. And the next question would be how can we implement such data-driven approaches in chemical R&D departments um, in a way that we can utilize them most efficiently and to transform the way material research is done. So in this example, let's imagine we have here an example research team, and they might be distributed all over the world. Team member one might be a computational expert and, and a passionate data scientist, but they don't do the experiments. And team member two, shown here, and they are the project lead. And they are not involved in the day-to-day -day technical work of the project, but they are more concerned with the general direction and that the project stays on track. Team member three to five are experimentalists and domain experts. And they would like to use the computational or data-driven approaches to accelerate their research, but they cannot spend years studying the theory behind physics-based simulations or different machine learning approaches. So they would really like to have black box approaches where, which they can apply um, on a day-to-day -day basis um, when they have new ideas about molecules, for instance. And these different team members, they can now be connected by Life Design, which is a collaborative platform. And how, how does it look like? So first of all, it's a web-based approach. That means all the data relevant to the project can be accessed anytime by all the team members from anywhere in the world. The data are represented in a spreadsheet, which we can see schematically here on the right-hand plot. And um, basically, and, and by each compound, is, is, is a row and each column and in each column there's data associated with that compound and moreover it's not only important to have access to all the data but one also has to be able to quickly interpret them and therefore life design has um, intuitive chem informatics appro ap approaches and as well as intuitive um, as good approaches for the visualization analysis of all the data 
Together, this leads to a democratization of the data where every, everyone can access and interpret easily all the relevant information or to make appropriate decisions. Last but not least, um, the physics-based and machining approaches can be embedded and run automatically with one click by every team member. This means we are, not, um, we are also having a democratization of expertise which gives non-expert users um, access to advanced physics-based simulations and machine learning approaches. How does it look in practice? First of all, team member one, which was the expert on computational chemistry, they will set up sophisticated computational models or train machine learning models based on computational or experimental data provided by team members three to five. And team members three to five which are the experimentalists, they can use these computational models to run them on new virtual structures to obtain the properties without having to synthesize them. They can also analyze and visualize the results for all team members. And um, team member two, who is responsible for the project management, they can see the progress in real time. What they can then can do, they can rate the investigated materials, they say it's good material, let's go on to synthesis, or it's, it's not a good material, let's discard this candidate. Today in this talk, we have discussed the three different aspects of the molecular platform, the physics-based modeling, the machine learning approaches, and the enterprise informatics. And to summarize, we have seen that physics-based simulations and machine learning approaches can accelerate materials research and reduce time to market. And the Schrodinger platform provides a um, highly automated computational workflow and this allows expert users to screen huge um, structural libraries, and it enables non-expert users to, um, um, to use the latest simulation and machine learning technology. Um, Schrodinger also provides life design and enterprise as an en enterprise informatic solution, which offers an easy web-based collaboration and excellent intuitive kin informatics. This leads to a democratization of all the data and allows everybody involved in the pro project to get all the relevant information to make appropriate decisions. Moreover, it provides embedded workflows, which saves expert users valuable time and gives non-expert users access to all state-of-the-art physics-based simulations and machine learning approaches. And by managing experimental data and predictive modeling side by side, um, research teams can now drive new ideas. Thank you very much, Laura. Uh, for those who missed the very beginning, Laura skarbath evers is a senior scientist at Schrodinger. Uh, that was a fantastic presentation. And for those who are here live, we will cut to a, a Q&A section in just a minute or so. But first of all, I'd just like to highlight, perhaps you came here because you're interested in digitization and the, the chemistry side of it. Perhaps materials isn't your thing, or perhaps you're more broadly interested in this. Well, this webinar is part of a series that we're doing with Schrodinger throughout 2021. So let me show you some of the ones we have already done so far this year and let you know how you can register in order to uh, find details about future ones coming up. So on screen in just a second, it should load up very soon, is uh, the list of Schrodinger webinars that we've done uh, recently. You can see we've looked at molecular modeling for the medicinal chemistry toolkit, novel organic electronic materials. So if your specific interest is in organic electronic materials, then that's, that's the right one for you physics-based computation modeling to uh, biologics as well. So you can see how the sorts of approaches and the data handling that we've looked at today can also be applied to different areas of scientific research. And it may be that one of these events that you happen to miss is actually more appropriate, more targeted to you. So do uh, keep an eye out at the website that we've just sent you in the uh, links box at the bottom of uh, the GoToWebinar panel there. That has all of the Schrodinger webinars that we've done. They're all there available for you to register now. Uh, so do please dive in. And in fact, we've got another one coming up uh, next month as well. This hasn't yet made it onto the webpage, but it will be open to register soon. That's on the 29th of July, again at three o'clock, same time as today. And that's on trends in modern hit discoveries. We're looking at how ultra large screens can benefit from machine learning. We're really pleased to say that we've got Matt 
Mark Rapasky, who's Senior Vice President at Schrodinger. He's joining us for that one. If you'd like to know more about upcoming webinars from Schrodinger and our other partners, then the best thing for you to do is register for an account with Chemistry World. So go to chemistryworld.com, hit the register button at the top and give us your details so that you're happy to receive emails. And then we will send you an email about every webinar that we've got coming up. Make sure you never miss an opportunity to, uh, to engage with our fantastic partners and uh, to see some of the topics, including some of these fantastic ones that we've already had and coming up. So do please do that and you'll find out all the latest. Um, but that is it for this Chemistry World webinar. So one final huge thank you to Laura for joining us today and for putting together that presentation. We covered a lot in the last hour. And so if there's anything that you missed or would like to see again, we will send you a link to the recording. We don't share the slides uh, themselves because what we think is valuable is not just what's happening on screen, but also what's being said by our fantastic guests, people like Laura. So we'll send you the recording and you get the full value of the slides in the context of the presentation. So also a final thank you to Schrodinger. Once again, this is part of a series of webinars that we're doing with them. They're constantly providing us with excellent guests covering valuable and important areas of, of science and how these data handling approaches can make sure that people do the best research and help to make truly world changing discoveries and developments uh, and doing them as efficiently as possible. So they're a, a common, a, a regular Chemistry World partner and one that we're delighted to have with us. So thank you to Schrodinger for, for handing us Laura for getting in touch and uh, Thank you to all of you for attending today's webinar. I'm Ben Valsler, Chemistry World's Digital Editor, and we'll see you for the next Chemistry World webinar. Thanks again.